have to fear is in war. Fear is there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor, for our sons and daughters, never mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. Samuel Adams said, The liberties of our country and the freedom of our civil constitution are worth defending against all hazards, and it is our duty to defend them against all attacks. It is our duty to defend them against all attacks, and that's why we do Foundations of Freedom Thursday here on Wall Builders Live. You've found the intersection of faith and politics. It's our opportunity on Thursdays to dive deep into those principles that made America the greatest nation in history. That means studying our Constitution, our Declaration, the Founding Fathers, what they were thinking, why they did what they did. If we can learn those principles, we can do our part in preserving and defending those wonderful rights that uh, we've had a chance to live here in our nation. So I'm Rick Green here with David Barton, and looking forward to today's Foundations of Freedom Thursday, David. We do get great questions. I got a stack of them here in front of me that are always a lot of fun and every Thursday. And, and, and you know, people respond to this as well because I, we've seen just the, the, the really good response of people sending in great questions and asking really thoroughly intelligent questions. And they're, they're not like superficial. It's like they're, they're thinking the stuff through. And so it's been fun to see that. And we're going to cover one of those issues today that comes up in questions because we got a great guest that's going to talk about one of these. But before we do that, I, I want to go back to you for a minute. I mean, you you went to Independence Hall and you taped Constitutional Live, which is a course that you had been teaching across the country, really popular course. And I, I'll tell you, quite frankly, I was shocked at how many churches had you come in and teach Constitutional Live at their church. And I just I didn't think I was going to see that in my lifetime where the people started understanding that. No, no, no. There's biblical foundations of the Constitution. This is this is not a secular document in that sense. It has biblical roots. But w- when you went in and taped that why? I mean, what what was going on in your thinking that says, hey, I need to get this down and tape, and, and, and why teach the Constitution? Man, you know, it almost happened by accident. People were calling and, and asking, wanting to learn more and convince me to, to, to spend a little more time actually going deeper into the Constitution, because sometimes people will say, yeah, I love the Constitution, but they don't even read it, or even if they yeah. read it, that's it. They don't really dive into the thinking of the Founding Fathers, and and just honestly, getting to learn at your feet for the last 12, 15 years, however long it's been we've been together, uh, it made me hungry to know things that I didn't know. Because I would get questions, and I'd be like, you know, I, I studied the Constitution, but I have no idea what you're talking about. And it made me hungry to go learn more. And so after a couple of years, actually, of teaching the course out there, I would always spend a good 30, 45 minutes at the end of the class just taking questions from people. And it made me go do homework to learn more about all these things that I wasn't familiar with. And so after two years of doing that on the road and getting all those questions and doing more homework, we decided to actually take those questions and really turn it into a full class there at Independence Hall. And and so we could pass it on and get other people to study the same things that we've been studying. Well, it seems to me like there's been almost like a revival of interest in the Constitution. And and just like we're seeing a revival of interest in the Bible. And so many people who say, well, I like the Bible have never read it. They don't know what's in it. Same with the Constitution. Now we're seeing like a revival of interest in actually knowing what it says and, I don't know, I extrapolate. What's the consequences of actually knowing what it says? I mean, what you, do you, do? you know what's been cool is the, the shock that I've seen on people's faces whenever you start laying out the evidence and you start telling the stories of what actually happened. What happens is there's, it, what I've noticed is there's a connection between what they felt in their gut was right or wrong, and yeah. they've been upset and frustrated with the things that have happened in the country, the things the president has been doing that are unconstitutional, just the, all of the things that have been wrong over the last few years, and they've known in their gut it was wrong, but there wasn't. they couldn't intellectually put their finger on it because they just didn't have the information. And so when we would get done with these classes, I could see it on their faces, and, the, and just in the things they would say, it was like that connection suddenly happened between what they felt in their gut and what they now knew in their head was right and wrong because they had the evidence. And by just bringing that knowledge of the actual truth, man, it set people on fire. And I, and I think that's part of what's happening in the country. You know, it's not I'm not the only one out there doing this. I mean, Hillsdale College has a great class on this. Mike Ferris has a great class. There's been this awakening in, uh, uh, towards the Constitution that is going to have a, a very positive ramifications for the country over the course of the next decade or two. Well, it seems like it's almost like 
we knew we should have been doing this. I yeah. Mean, you go, go back 15 years ago and Congress passed that federal law on Constitution Day that every single public school in the United States has to spend September the 17th, Constitution Day, studying the Constitution of the United States. And yet 90 percent of public schools don't do that. But somebody 15 years ago was thinking we really ought to know the Constitution. And then, you know, how long ago was it that you did the celebrate the celebrate? Freedom law. It I mean, was it was pretty close to that. Actually, it was about thirteen years ago. And honestly, David, I did that because of my own ignor- ignorance. <laughs> I was embarrassed when I could not name the five freedoms out of the First Amendment. And, and Texas had had a poll, and you know, it was like ninety five percent of people could not name uh, more than one freedom. Only fifty percent could name one free. And I sat there and I laughed at that. And then I tried to name them, and it embarrassed me so much. Just personally, I was just sitting in my office by myself reading the article, and I thought. Man, that's terrible. I'm a lawyer. I'm a political junkie. I live this stuff. I'm a legislator, and I couldn't name them. And it really started me on a journey to study, but also on a journey to try to get other people to do the same thing and actually get it back into our classrooms. And that's when we did Celebrate Freedom Week. Uh, but it's also why I wanted to teach this class because, you know, it, it, you honestly, though, David, I got I to gotta add something to this. History and the Constitution and all those things, even back when I went to law school and college, it was boring to me. But you brought it to life, and the first time somebody handed me a cassette tape of, and I'm I'm aging myself here, but it was a cassette tape of you teaching the founding fathers, and for the first time as I listened to that, it was fun. I actually enjoyed learning about the men and the women that founded this country, and that made me more interested in studying the principles. And honestly, that's what I wanted to do with Constitutional Live was take that same love of these things that you instilled in me and try to get other people to experience the same thing. Now, here's the other side of that. You would think that this would be everybody would be unanimous in support of this, but clearly they're not. So, I mean, who's going to be threatened? Who, who literally is going to be threatened by teaching the Constitution or, or reading the Constitution or studying the um, because there's opposition to this. I mean, who's the opposition yeah. and why? I mean, Man, why they, would they do that? Without a, without a doubt, it's the very people that have benefited from an ignorance in our country about our Constitution. So if we don't know the Constitution, if we don't know what it really says, what the founders really intended and what the principles are, then people are able to get into positions of power and twist and, and, and destroy and, and deceive by absolutely distorting what the Constitution actually is. And so they're able to move us down a road of socialism. They're able to gain more power for themselves. They're able to take power away from the people. So they have benefited from ignorance about the Constitution. So if you start teaching people the Constitution, if you start handing people a Constitution, they're not going to like that because it's going to threaten their power, the power of, of the ivory tower elites on college campuses, the power of the left-wing folks that have taken over our government at virtually every level, all those folks, their power is going to be threatened if the people start actually reading the Constitution. Well, and those ivory tower elites you're talking about, we now have the second incidence in just a matter of weeks where that a, a, a university campus, state university campus, has forbidden students from handing out copies of the Constitution. So clearly, these are the guys who benefit from, from their kids not knowing what the Constitution says but we thought, you know, this is so much a Foundation Freedom Thursday, just actually reading and knowing the Constitution, that this would be a good one to cover on, on, on this week's Foundation Freedom Thursday. And I thought folks that, that are good at covering this are the folks who are having to defend these kids for giving out constitutions. Robert Shibley is going to be with us. Uh, FIRE is a great organization out there that defends the First Amendment rights of students on college campuses across the country. And he's going to talk to us about what happened at the University of Hawaii. Uh, just amazing that students would be stopped from handing out pocket constitutions. Stay with us here on Wall Builders Live. Thomas Jefferson said, The Constitution of most of our states and of the United States assert that all power is inherent in the people that they may exercise it by themselves, that it is their right and duty to be at all times armed, that they are entitled to freedom of person, freedom of religion, freedom of property, and freedom of press. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. How should we respond if confronted with frustration and conflict? The proper response was given over 200 years ago in a lengthy speech when Benjamin Franklin told the delegates at the Constitutional Convention, in this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding? Have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? God governs in the affairs of men. I therefore move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. Benjamin Franklin knew that prayer was the proper response. 
For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Welcome back to the Intersection of Faith and Politics, Wall Builders Live. Thanks for staying with us. Our guest today, Robert Shibley. He's with FIRE. That's the Foundation for Individual Rights. They defend students all across the nation on college campuses who are essentially uh, shut up if their opinion is not uh, whatever the popular or politically correct opinion might be. Robert, thanks for coming on, sir. Thanks for having me. Hey, so I thought that the Constitution was still the law of the land and maybe something that we would want students reading, but apparently on some campuses you can't even hand them out. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the rule on many campuses. Our research shows that uh, out of the 400 uh, biggest and most prestigious universities in America, about 59% of the public universities of those uh, have speech codes uh, that restrict people from engaging in their constitutionally protected free speech rights. So over half, some sort of a of a uh, you know a policed First Amendment, I guess, limited only when it's approved by the quote unquote officials. That's right, and that's actually down from a few years ago when it was uh, around 70 percent. Wow. So how does this work? I mean, in in, in the case that, that got headlines recently, you had some students just wanting to hand out copies of the Constitution, but were told they that was that was not allowed. I can't believe I, I have a hard time even saying this. Not allowed to hand out the Constitution. That's right, and that's actually only uh, that's the second time that it happened in just a few months. Uh, the first case was at Modesto Junior College in California. This. Uh, happened, the more recent one, I should say, happened at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, uh, where a student uh, wanted to come out from behind her table uh, to pass out copies of the Constitution because uh, there wasn't really enough traffic going by her table, and uh, the authorities from the campus told her that she wasn't allowed to do that. So now, this is not, I'm assuming, I guess I should ask, she, she was, was she accosting people? Was she, you know, stopping them and slamming it in their face or forcing it into their hands or into their backpack? I mean, sure, it must have been violent. That was why they wanted to stop it. Uh, no, she wasn't doing anything like that. And in fact, they didn't accuse her of doing anything like that. They just said that, uh, you need to stay behind your table at all times. And uh, you're not allowed to pass out uh, literature this way. In fact, uh, as she says in her lawsuit, uh, everybody who she tried to hand a constitution to uh, took it. Um, so there, there wasn't any sort of allegations that it was violent. It was simply uh, trying to pass out uh, copies of the Constitution. I mean, this is actually a good deal because, you know, when I buy a, a pocket constitution online, it's, you know, 50 cents or a dollar. She's saving the money. She's giving them one for free. Why would they be against this? I, how does this work in terms of just... I mean, conceptually, what we think of as the college campus, isn't that supposed to be the you know, arena of ideas? This is where you debate things. This is where you get exposed to other ways of, of thinking. How does this fit with it, this whole free speech zone fit within our perception of what the college campus ought to be? Well, you know, it doesn't fit within our perception of what the college campus ought to be. Uh, people are, are frequently very surprised to find out uh, how many restrictions colleges have on free speech, like this free speech zone, which at Hilo is actually sort of a low, grassy area uh, with a drain in it, and apparently it, it floods a little bit when it rains there, which, of course, it being Hawaii, it rains <laughs> very, very frequently uh, and gets very muddy. So that, that's where everybody is supposed to engage in that protected First Amendment activity, which is just you know simply speaking your mind on campus. The First Amendment covers all of our expressions, so it, it's really a shockingly restrictive uh, policy, and, and universities... Um, really should know better than to try to quarantine free speech of these tiny zones. I, I kind of, I kind of get it from from their perspective, though. I mean, it, it, it's typical of of left wing, um, you know, procedure it, because of them being so shaky in their their own worldview and their own convictions, and so concerned that the other side might have a chance to actually uh, propose um, all you know other ideas. Uh, it's just great to put the opposition in some corner where they can't actually reach the student body because now you get your one-sided approach of, of, of indoctrination in the classroom without them having an opportunity to hear from other students and actually be challenged. I can understand why they would want to do this. Well, you know, freedom of speech is never friendly uh, to the authorities. Um, freedom of speech is there and it's protected by the First Amendment to protect people who have things uh, that might be minority viewpoints or they might be controversial things to say on a college campus. Uh, you know, unfortunately, often uh, handing out constitutions uh, represents kind of a minority viewpoint. Um, and so the authorities never like the fact 
that they have to give us freedom of speech. You see, um, you know, this this lesson coming outside of campuses too at at political uh, rallies and, and and conventions. So it this while this more, sort of started on college campuses in America at least, it really is spread out from there and it's teaching students all the wrong lessons about what it's like to be a free person in a free society. I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, Robert, I want to ask you, you guys have been around for about 15 years now, I ask you how this has uh, changed or if it's the same. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? I mean, in, in the things that you guys have been doing, you've been winning a lot of battles. So I'm just kind of, I want to get kind of a lay of the land of what's happening in, ter- in terms of, of the culture on our campuses in, in light of the last 15 years of you guys fighting for uh, free speech rights. Folks, stay with us. Robert Chibley is our guest. The organization is called FIRE. And, Robert, the, the website, real quick, as we're going to break. Thefire.org. Thefire.org. Even if you're not on campus, good organization to follow. Get on their email list. Find out more because it's important for us to be fighting for these rights for our young people on campuses across the country. Stay with us here on Wobbleters Live. President Calvin Coolidge said, The more I study the Constitution... The more I realize that no other document devised by the hand of man has brought so much progress and happiness to humanity. To live under the American Constitution is the greatest political privilege that was ever accorded to the human race. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Today, numerous court decisions demonstrate that there's often a conflict between the courts, the law, and religion. Has this conflict always existed? Not according to James Wilson. James Wilson was a signer of both the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. He was a law professor as well as an original justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. James Wilson saw no conflict between religion and the law. In fact, just the contrary. He declared, Human law must rest its authority, ultimately upon the authority of that law which is divine. Far from being rivals or enemies, religion and law are twin sisters, friends, and mutual assistants. Indeed, these two sciences run into each other. In the views of founding father James Wilson, religion and good civil law were inseparable. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Welcome back. Thanks for staying with us here on Wall Builders Live. Robert Shibley, our guest today. We're talking about uh, free speech on campuses. The organization is called FIRE. The website is thefire.org. And uh, just a great organization that's been fighting for 15 years. And, Robert, as I was going to break, I, I, I wanted to ask you about kind of the lay of the land over the last 15 years since you guys have been defending students and and uh, dealing with this issue on, on campuses, not just at the University of Hawaii and and, and um, what where was it in Modesta, California, I guess, same situation on constitutions not being handed out. Y'all have dealt with this on campuses all over the country. How, how are we doing in this battle? Well, you know, it has its victories and its losses. Uh, like I said a few years ago, more colleges had speech codes uh, than they do now. So there's definitely been an improvement there, but uh, particularly in recent times, uh, we've seen a lot of controversy over graduation speakers uh, coming uh, to speak to campuses. Condoleezza Rice, probably the um, best-known example of someone who backed off uh, of being the Rutgers uh, speaker uh, after a lot of students and faculty led a movement to disinvite her. Um, she wasn't disinvited technically. She backed out on her own. But uh, campuses have been advancing this idea that your beliefs shouldn't be challenged, um, that uh, you know everything that you're going to hear is going to come from an echo chamber. And uh, it, it's really – Unfortunately, in many cases, it's become a rude awakening, I think, for students to realize that there's people out there uh, who don't agree with them and who have just as many rights to, to say that uh, as, as they do. And uh, we're trying to make campuses a place uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a fake, uh, safe-seeming uh, environment for students. But, in fact, uh, you know, you're not safe simply because you're not hearing the opposing viewpoint. You might think you are, but uh, the, the opponents are still out there. Well, and, and there was some quote from some official that said this isn't really the 60s anymore. People can't really protest like this. Any- I mean, again, back to how this fits into our idea of the campus. Um, you know, I'm not saying let's go back to the 60s, but I do like the idea of, of people being able to speak their mind and share their view. And unfortunately, the any sort of uh, constitutional or conservative viewpoint is the minority on college campuses now. We need to have that voice. Do they really believe now that the left wingers dominate the the faculty and the and the control of the campus that they're going to be able to just silence the people on, that that are you know more traditional? 
Well, I think they do believe that because they've had a lot of success with it. Um, Alan Charles Coors, who's a professor at, at the University of Pennsylvania and is one of FIRE's founders, uh, calls this the great generational swindle. Uh, because it, as it turns out, that the 60s radicals who were in charge of campuses, or who were uh, opposing those who were in charge of campuses back then, are now the ones who are in charge of campuses, and they're sort of doing the same thing that they felt happened to them. Like I said, the, the people who are the authorities and the people in power, they never want to hear uh, from the people who disagree with them. And unfortunately, it doesn't really matter uh, it seems what you professed uh, maybe in your younger days. Uh, nobody likes to have folks who disagree with you running around and, and talking about that, and maybe you know making you seem a little bit uh, closed-minded or, or not as smart as everybody would. You would like everybody to think you are. How how are young people on campus that tend to be in the minority now and have a conservative point of view? How are they taking the idea of essentially getting to be the rebels this time around? I mean, now that you're in the minority, you know, the conservatives get to be these young people, get to be the ones <laughs> that are the rebels on campus. Are they embracing that? Are they seeing that as kind of a cool thing? Uh, or are they dis, you know, disenchanted by it? Uh, a little of both. Some of them do embrace that. Some of them, uh, like the students at Hawaii, Merritt Birch and Anthony Vizone, they're excited to stand up uh, for their rights. Uh, but I think for the most part, now, students see getting a college degree as really, really important um, for their uh, future, you know, employment potential and everything. And while the folks who stand up for free speech really, uh, you know, don't risk losing their college degree, it can certainly seem scary to take on your college. Um, and so I think uh, increasingly, you know, students would rather just, you know, not say anything. Thankfully, there's a, there's a lot of people out there. There's still a, a minority out there who's willing to stand up and say, no, I'm not going to take this. But overall, I do think it is teaching students that uh, they don't dare express uh, things that are outside the campus mainstream. Well, hopefully we can uh, can turn that around and get more voices out there willing to stand. Thankfully, guys like you uh, backing them up and, and helping them out and giving them the tools they need. If you're a young person uh, listening to the program right now and you're on a college campus concerned about this, Robert, what can they do to join your organization? Do you guys have chapters on campuses? How does it work? We don't have chapters, but we do have a FIRE student network, and we can uh, teach you how to be an activist. You can apply for internships. We have a, a summer uh, conference that you can apply to attend. So there's a lot of things that FIRE can do to help educate you and help you be an activist for this, and you can find all that at our website, thefire.org. Thefire.org. Go there to find out more today. Robert, greatly appreciate you coming on, spending a little bit of time with us, educating us. Thank you for fighting for free speech on campus campuses across the country. Thanks for having me. Stay with us, folks. Back in a moment with David Barton. Hey, this is Tim Barton with Wall Builders. And as you've had the opportunity to listen to Wall Builders Live, you've probably heard the wealth of information about our nation, about our spiritual heritage, about the religious liberties, about all the things that makes America exceptional. And you might be thinking, as incredible as this information is, I wish there was a way that I could get one of the Wall Builders guys to come to my area and share with my group, whether it be a church, whether it be a Christian school or public school or some political event or activity. If you're interested in having a Wall Builder speaker come to your area, you can get on our website at www.wallbuilders.com and there's a tab for scheduling and if you'll click on that tab you'll notice there's a list of information from speakers bios to events that are already going on and there's a section where you can request an event to bring this information about who we are where we came from our religious liberties and freedoms go to the wall builders website and bring a speaker to your area Abraham Lincoln said, We the people are the rightful masters of both Congress and the courts. Not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who pervert the Constitution. Welcome back to Wall Builders Live. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, David, I couldn't help but think about, you know, not wanting people to study the Constitution. Back when I first started doing the Constitutional Live class, I carried a, a Constitution that had been printed and the publisher put a warning at the beginning of the Constitution. Here's what it said. <laughs> this book is a product of its time and does not reflect the same values as it would if it were written today. Parents might wish to discuss with their children how views on race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and interpersonal relations have changed since this book was written before allowing them to read this classic work. A parental warning on the Constitution, David. Well, I tell you what, there, there's one thing we know for sure. There's probably no institution in the United States more secular than, than state education is right now, hands down. And one thing that we know from the founders and the way they set the government up was 
if you have an anti-biblical secularism, and that doesn't mean you have to be a Christian. Franklin wasn't a Christian. Jefferson wasn't a Christian. But if you have an anti-biblical secularism, which they did not, if you have an anti-biblical secularism, it will never produce lasting freedom or a limited government, either one. And so it takes that biblical influence and biblical understanding of the, the nature and character of man, the nature and character of government, uh, the nature and character of what constitutes limited government, only from that biblical understanding that God himself gives, because God ordained limited government. He did not ordain a government that gets into every detail as we're seeing with secular governments. And if you want limited government, you cannot be secularist. And yet state universities, there is no institution more secularist than state universities right now. No wonder they don't want the Constitution read because it leads toward unlimited government. We want limited government, and it does not produce individual freedoms, and that's what we want is individual freedom. So I, I can understand why they don't want the Constitution out there, and I can understand why they would put parental warnings in there because a secular mentality will do that. They don't want the, the individual rights. They don't want the unlimited. They don't want the limited government, and they don't want the individual freedoms that we enjoy. Yep, they've, they've benefited greatly from an that's ignorance right. about our founding principles, but we're going to change that by bringing back those founding principles, and we do that with Foundations of Freedom Thursday. We appreciate you joining us today. Take this program and share it with your friends. Help to educate your neighbors and your family, and we can save this country and preserve this constitutional republic. You've been listening to Wall Builders Live. President Thomas Jefferson said, I know no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. We stand undivided.